So why don't we get underway? I have 901. That leaves us a little bit of a grace period for those who are a little bit late. I want to say good morning from Boston, but good afternoon and good evening to other folks from different parts of the world. I'm Bob O'Keefe, Vice President of the Health Effects Institute. And on behalf of our uh, workshop co-sponsors, the European Respiratory Society, and my co-chairs, Rana Anderson uh, of the University of Copenhagen and ERS, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar on a new study from HEI. It's called Effects of Low-Level Air Pollution, a Study in Europe for Elapse, more commonly. This is a Europe-wide collaboration in research on mortality and morbidity, effects of long-term exposure to low-level PM2.5, black carbon, NO2, and ozone in an analysis of multiple European cohorts. The study was funded by HEI, and for those of you who may not know, HEI is an independent nonprofit research institute jointly funded by government and industry to provide high quality policy relevant and stringent peer review uh, science on the health effects of air pollution. We do this without sponsor involvement in our research process and, take, and take, not taking or endorsing policy positions. The new research you'll hear about today was conducted by uh, Principal Investigator Bert Brunekrev and his many European colleagues and examines associations between exposures to low concentrations of ambient air pollution and civil health outcomes among some 28 million participants in 22 European cohorts. The study was funded through HEI's program to investigate the health effects of long-term exposures to low levels of air pollution in very large populations across the United States, Canada, and Europe. As one of three major coordinated HEI studies on this topic, it comes, it comes, as you all know, at an important time. With completion of the European Fitness Check, there's currently much interest in air pollution effects at or below current regulatory standards and limit values, and in the context of the recent release of the new WHO air quality guidelines, an effort to revise the EU's air quality directives, and US EPA's revisiting of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or PM2.5. The goals of today's webinar are twofold, to present a lapse, populations, methods, and results in the context of the broader scientific literature, and to outline and discuss the relevant risk and policy decisions that elapse can help inform in the US, the EU, and beyond. To help us understand and answer these questions and opportunities, we have an outstanding set of presenters, including leading scientists from across Europe and the United States, and a range of governmental regulators, public health officials, and non-governmental stakeholders. As outlined in your agenda, today's webinar will consist of two sessions. The first session on elapse and the results will be moderated by HEI, and the second on policy implications moderated by ERS. Both sessions will be followed by uh, question and answer periods. Finally, I'm pleased to report that we have a very large number of registered uh, participants. We had over 700 register for today's workshop, uh, and I wanted to highlight some logistical information for you. Today's webinar will be recorded for later posting on the web. The slides will be available separately and we'll hold questions till the end of each of the two major sessions after all the speakers have finished. All audience, all audience members will be muted. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions and the chairs will pass them on to the speakers. Please try to avoid using the chat for questions as that becomes challenging to sort out questions from comments. With those housekeeping measures behind us, I'm very pleased to introduce Hannah, our first speaker, Dr. Hannah Bogart. Hannah Bogart, PhD, is an air pollution epidemiologist and principal scientist at the Health Effects Institute. She's based in the Netherlands for HEI. At the Institute, she is involved in developing new research programs, research oversight, and review of studies investigating the health effects of air pollution. And importantly, she was the oversight scientist of the HEI program to investigate health effects of low levels of air pollution. Hanna, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. Um, do you see my slides? We see your slides, thank you. Super, thank you. Well, thank you for this, uh, for this kind introduction. Um, so let's dive right in. Uh, why study the health effects of low levels of, of ambient air pollution? Um, there are many reasons to pursue such research. Uh, the levels of ambient air pollution have decreased over time, uh, in particular in North America and Western Europe. Uh, new epidemiologic studies reported associations of air pollution with health effects at levels below current air quality standards. Uh, and yet there's uncertainty in those studies, uh, and especially about the exposure response function uh, at the low end of the exposure curve. 
Um, this information is critical uh, for use in risk assessment and regulation. Uh, so in this picture, um, you see here what an, an exposure response function uh, would look like. This is just an example uh, using data uh, from Canada for PM 2.5 and, and total mortality. Uh, you will see a lot of those uh, plots here today. So I'm not going into the details here, uh, but note in the picture, the different um, standards and guidelines um, that are plotted here for reference. Um, and the European limit value um, is not on here. Uh, because it's currently set at 25 microgram per cubic meter uh, higher than the US uh, standard and, and much higher actually than the WHO air quality uh, guidelines. Um, so Dorota Jarosinski will talk later uh, about the new WHO air quality guidelines. So for now, just to mention that there is a growing number of studies investigating the health effects of low levels of ambient air pollution. And you see here the list of studies identified for PM 2.5 underpinning the WHO um, air quality guidelines ordered by um, the average concentrations uh, from low to high. So no surprise here, the evidence for the lowest levels um, are from Canada. Uh, actually the first five studies here, the ones in green, um, then there's a bunch of US studies. Those are the ones in, um, in yellow. And there are a few from uh, Europe uh, in, in pink and some other regions uh, of the world. Um, so in the systematic review, they, they identified all the literature up to um, October 2018. Now, after that, there are many more uh, very recent studies published uh, also from Australia, um, and New Zealand investigating the health effects of low levels of, of air pollution. So in order to study um, those effects, you'll need very large uh, populations. Uh, this is often accomplished uh, by using administrative databases, um, such as census data or, or uh, health insurance programs, or combining existing cohorts, such as the European uh, ESCAPE study uh, led by Bert Brunegrave uh, some years ago. So advantage of those large studies is that there is this great statistical power, which is of course important uh, when studying low, low uh, uh, levels. Another advantage of those huge studies is that they're often more representative of the general population, which is important if you want to use that study for burden and, uh, and benefit assessments in particular. Um, you can appreciate the challenges when conducting such large uh, studies. The existing monitoring network uh, have limited spatial coverage uh, with typically very low, uh, very few stations in, in suburban and rural uh, locations. And really to come up with reliable exposure estimates um, for all those people is not trivial. It's actually quite complicated and you'll hear about that um, in this webinar shortly. So really the beauty of using administrative databases is that those databases are often uh, huge, um, but unfortunately there is not a lot of individual level information in those databases. Uh, for example, what is often lacking is data on smoking or uh, data on somebody's diet, whereas the traditional smaller cohorts have that detailed um, information. So indirect approaches are often needed to account for that. And again, we will hear also about that in this webinar. Um, so at HEI, we issued a request for applications uh, some years ago to exactly examine the health effects of low levels of ambient air pollution, so long-term exposure, and really with an emphasis on the characterization of the exposure response function at the low end, not only for PM 2.5, but also on, for other pollutants. Um, also a piece of the request for application was method development. So at the end of the day, we funded uh, three uh, very large studies, as, as Bob already mentioned. Um, um, millions of people actually um, in the US, in Canada and in Europe, either using administrative databases or traditional cohorts. A common feature of all three studies is that they developed high quality exposure models 
uh, at high spatial resolution using data from many different data sources, including a satellite data. And here, what you can see are the uh, three um, principal investigators of the three teams. Obviously, we have Bert Brunegrave uh, for the European studies, uh, and you will hear everything about that today. Um, for the other studies, there is the US study led by Francesca Dominici from Harvard. So she is uh, investigating uh, the low, low levels health effects in, in the Medicare cohort. So Medicare is a nation, nationwide health insurance program um, for all people aged 65 and older. Um, and we have the uh, Canadian study led by Mike uh, Brower from the University of British Columbia, and he is making use of Canadian census data. And really just a note that we are talking about low levels of, of air pollution. So um, on average in the European study, the, um, the annual average PM 2.5 was uh, 15, about 15 microgram per cubic meter. In the US, it was a little lower, about 11 microgram per cubic meter. And in Canada, it was actually even lower, about an average of seven microgram per cubic meter. So you can appreciate with those very large studies that there's, there's a huge uh, a, a team, a huge team involved, actually three huge teams, um, many different institutes, um, I'm sure many familiar uh, faces. And um, how HEI works is that uh, we have detailed oversight of, of actually all our studies, but also uh, obviously um, this set of studies. Uh, in this case, we had an, an oversight panel, which was chaired by, um, by John Samet from the Colorado School of Public Health. We had progress reports coming in, we had workshops, we had meetings. We had also external QA, QC audits, really checking the data to make sure everything is of high quality and, and traceable. Um, also for the final report, we had an individual um, special review panel looking at the uh, reports and also prepare commentaries. And those commentaries, they are always published uh, together with the final report. Um, so the US and the Canadian phase one reports are actually uh, published, they are already published um, um, in November 2018, they are all on our website uh, for everybody to use, and the phase two reports will be published uh, shortly. And just a, a last note that some joint analyses are ongoing across the three teams uh, where they will make use of one exposure metric, one exposure model, uh, the same set of covariates and um, the same statistical analysis. So that, that is also uh, going to be pretty powerful uh, going forward. Um, I, I almost end here. These are the conclusions of the US and the Canadian phase one uh, reports. Basically, there is initial evidence for an association between mortality and exposure uh, at levels below the current US uh, standard with no uh, observable threshold. Uh, you know, the exposure response function was, was either actually pretty linear or supralinear, uh, with a steeper slope at the lowest levels. Um, really for today, I'm very excited uh, to have this webinar. Uh, we published the European study uh, last month. Um, it's on our website. It's really unprecedented. It analyzed a full cohort of nine uh, well-characterized cohorts as well as seven large administrative cohorts, not only on mortality, um, but also morbidity effects, including um, lung cancer incidents and uh, coronary events, uh, not only on PM 2.5, but also NO2, uh, black carbon and ozone, and really at a high spatial uh, resolution um, residential address level. So I'll, this is what I was planning uh, to say. I cannot wait um, to hear the results today. And thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. That was great. Thank you for taking the time. Very concise presentation. Um, I'd like to move on to our next speaker, um, who needs no introduction in many ways. He's Bert Bernekrebs, PhD, well known to all of you, and is 
currently Professor Emeritus of the Environmental Epidemiology of Environmental Epidemiology at the Institute for Risk Assessment Sciences at Utrecht University in the Netherlands and so much more. Bert will be talking today about the elapsed study um, in, the, in the pooled cohort. Welcome Bert and the screen is yours. Okay, I'll try to share my screen. <clears throat> There you go. Is this visible to everybody? Yes. Good. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Anna and Bob. Uh, I'm going to introduce the ELAP study to you. Uh, as far as the pool cohort is concerned, the other part will be given in a presentation by Massimo Stafogia immediately after mine. The objectives of the ELAP study are to investigate uh, the associations between long-term exposure to low levels of PM2.5, NO2, ozone, like carbon, <laughs> natural and cost specific mortality, incidence of lung cancer and cardiovascular events, but also incidence of asthma and COPD. Methods, we pulled eight of the escape cohorts and added the Danish nurse cohorts to that. So the, those are the nine cohorts that uh, Hannah was mentioning. We had large administrative cohorts from seven countries in Europe. The eight, the pooled eight cohorts were uh, had altogether some 400,000 subjects. The administrative cohorts, more than 28 million subjects. Those are again the topic of the second presentation by Massimo Stafogia. We had a common codebook harmonizing individual and area level variables between cohorts. And we did central exposure assessment, PM2.5 and the other pollutants at a 100 by 100 meter resolution. Low concentrations for the purpose of this study and the purpose of this program were defined as concentrations below current annual guidelines and standards. Just to show a few examples, the, air quality, the previous air quality guideline of WHO for PM2.5 was 10. The EPA standard is 12 and the EU limit value as mentioned is 25. Anything below 25 qualifies as being low level uh, in, in some respects. NO2, the air quality guideline and the EU limit value are the same at 40 micrograms per meter cube. The EPA air quality standard is 100 micrograms per meter cube, so way higher than the European and the WHO number. The pooled cohorts consists of nine cohorts. Uh, almost half the part participants are from a large Austrian cohort in Vorarlberg. You can see the pie chart, uh, the relative contribution of the different cohorts. And the map, the open circles are the locations where these cohorts were being investigated. So again, almost 400,000 subjects in this pooled cohort and extensive covariate information on smoking, BMI, diet, and, and a number of other factors which uh, may be important in terms of uh, confounding associations between air pollution and health. The central exposure assessment consisted of Europe-wide hybrid land use regression models at a 100 by 100 meter scale. We used land use and road data, coupled that with satellite observations, as well as dispersion models as est estimates as additional predictors. Detailed descriptions of these methods are given in two papers by Case de Hoog and, and others, Environmental Research 2016 and Environment International 2018. And in view of the time, I won't get into the details of the exposure assessment any further in this presentation. The ground-based monitoring that we were able to use for this exposure assessment were on, from airbase on the one hand, there's hundreds and hundreds of monitoring stations across Europe, partly for NO2 and PM2.5, partly for NO2 only. We were also able to use the 2010 dedicated monitoring campaign results of the escape study which was centered around the participating cohorts. The spread across Europe is less than for the air-based monitoring data. On the local scale, the monitoring in escape was more detailed than, than we typically have for uh, air-based monitoring stations. Mm. We used Cox proportional hazard models with increasing levels of confounder control to do, do the epidemiologic analysis. As I mentioned, used 2010 pollutant concentrations use spline subset and threshold analyses to investigate the shape of the exposure response curves and effects at low levels. 
conducted systematically two pollutant models to see whether effects of one pollutant were compounded or influenced by adjustment for another pollutant and a large series of detailed sensitivity analyses. And the methods that we used are described in more detail in a recent paper from A.V. Samoli and colleagues in Environment International. So main results of the pooled cohort then. PM2.5 model results you've seen already. This is a somewhat larger map showing the highest concentrations in Europe in the Po Valley, even, be, even above the EU limit value, which is the reason why we did not recruit any cohorts in the Po Valley because they would not uh, fulfill the requirement of being at low level, as this, which is below the EU limit value of 25 micrograms per meter cube. NO2 map uh, looks to some extent the same, but it's also clear from the NO2 map that it's more focused on urban areas with high traffic densities as a determinant of NO2 concentrations. So the concentrations there are more, uh, high concentrations are more restricted to the densely populated areas in Western and Central Europe, as you can see, and big cities like Paris, which is in the insert. The distribution of the PM2.5 concentrations for each of the cohorts and sub cohorts is shown in this graph. Lowest concentrations in the four uh, Stockholm cohorts from Seance, higher concentrations in uh, some German cohorts and intermediate concentrations in Denmark. You can see for reference the EU limit value, everybody's well below that uh, by now in Europe. The EPA air quality standard and the WHO 2005 air quality guideline. You can see that the, there's a lot of variation within and between cohorts, uh, crossing the different lines in the, uh, as um, shown for the standards and guidelines. Similar picture for NO2. Now you can see that even within Stockholm cohorts, there's a fair amount of variation between cohorts, and that's because some of them are suburban or almost rural, some of them really inner city Stockholm cohorts. So there you get a different picture then the ones shown for PM2.5. Highest concentrations in some Dutch and German cohorts, the lowest concentrations, but not as clearly so in the Scandinavian cohorts for, for NO2. And the references are the uh, EU limit value of 40, the WHO HRAPI report quantification guideline, which is also used by the European Environment Agency to do health impact assessments of 20 micrograms per meter cube. Some further descriptive information of the concentrations, and you can see in red that the, for PM2.5 and NO2, there were still a fair amount of folks in the pooled cohort at that levels below 10 micrograms per meter cube for PM2.5, below 20, and even below 10 micrograms per meter cube for NO2, which is important when you're interested in low level effects. Pooled cohort had, as I mentioned, some 400,000 subjects. Subjects with full data were about 325,000. 47,000 deaths, more than 6 million person years of observation. So that's the starting point for the epidemiology analysis. The single pollutant mortality estimates are shown in this uh, table. For PM2.5, as well as NO2, as black carbon, there were clearly significant positive associations for all-cause mortality, for cardiovascular disease mortality, same story, significant associations of about the same magnitude, and a somewhat surprising negative association with ozone, which I will come back to later. As I mentioned in the beginning, we did uh, different uh, levels of confounder control, and this table shows the effects of increasing confounder control Model one, which has little confounders included in it, to model three, which has a full set of confounders, including neighborhood level confounders. What's interesting is that the uh, adjusted and the unadjusted effect estimates for PM2.5 or for all four pollutants actually are not all that different. So, for this analysis, it basically didn't matter very much whether you had or did not have information on smoking, BMI, etc because including that information did not make much difference in the effect estimate, as is shown in the table going from model one to model three. Some shapes, this is the natural splines for PM2.5 and NO2 for the pooled cohort. You can see that even below 10 micrograms per meter cubed, there was a clear 
increased hazard ratio for PM2.5, even below 20 micrograms per cubic meter NO2, clear increase in hazard ratios and leveling off at higher concentrations and becoming uninformative because of lack of data at the highest concentrations in, in, the, in the two graphs. We also did subset analysis, which means that you exclude uh, subjects from the analysis with, at, at increasingly lower concentrations. So if you look at the yellow uh, highlighted uh, parts in the PM2.5 table, for example, this shows that below 15 or below 12 micrograms per meter cubed, there is still a significant association with natural cause mortality. And that association was still there, but no longer significant because of the small number of observations below 10 micrograms per meter cube. For NO2, the associations were pretty much remained stable, somewhat less uh, precisely estimated because of the smaller number of observations, even below 20 micrograms per meter cube, as you can see in the bottom of this table. The population weighted mean correlations between pollutants are shown in this table. And it shows that for black carbon and NO2, both coming from traffic, the correlation is very high. So two polluted models are probably less informative for these two components for that reason. And it also shows that for ozone, there was a strong negative correlation, especially with the traffic components, NO2 and black carbon, for obvious reasons, I would say. But it makes it uh, probable or possible that the negative associations we saw between ozone and health have something to do with the strongly negative correlations with all the pollutants. Two pollutant models were used to address that issue. And the table is a bit busy, but it shows that for PM2.5 and NO2, the adjustment uh, made some difference to the effect estimates, but all effect estimates with natural cause mortality remain statistically significant. The association between black carbon and all cause mortality, natural cause mortality disappeared after adjustment for NO2. That may have something to do with the very high correlation between the two. The effect estimates for ozone increased a bit, but still remained significant uh, after adjustment for the other three co pollutants. We also looked at the effect of excluding one cohort at a time. Some cohorts might be more influential than others. And what this uh, figures basically show is that for PM2.5, it doesn't make any difference whether you exclude one, one or the other cohort. And at two black carbon, the effect estimates become a little less after the exclusion of the large Austrian cohort, but especially for ozone, which was high in the Austrian cohort. The effect estimate increased uh, rather clearly towards unity, but not quite reaching unity after excluding the big Austrian cohort. This made us dig a little deeper into, the, into what happens if you exclude the Austrian cohort and then do the adjusted uh, analysis. What this uh, table shows it's included uh, not in the report, but in the, in the recent DMJ paper that we published on this study. What this shows is that after the exclusion of one influential cohort, the effect estimates for ozone all are all uh, increased towards unity after adjustment for the three other pollutants. It's an important observation we feel. Um, as I mentioned, we used 2010 as the baseline year, uh, at the, as the main exposure year for the analysis. We of course realized that some of these cohorts were started much earlier than that in the 1990s. We extrapolated to baseline concentrations and found that uh, in view of the strong decrease in PM2.5 concentrations in Europe, to use baseline as a starting point and not 2010 year, the effect estimate for PM2.5, which was pretty high in the main model, actually reduced to a number which was more in line with other published uh, studies in recent years. The reduction was also visible for NO2 and black carbon, but less strongly so as for PM2.5. Now that's reduction, that's uh, ex extrapolation to baseline. We also use the more advanced uh, time varying analysis. And uh, we could see that in the time varying analysis, the PM2.5 effect estimate also decreased, not as much as with the baseline extrapolation. The effect estimates for NO2 and black carbon and ozone are pretty much unaffected by the time varying analysis. 
So these are all sensitivity analysis, giving you some more feeling for what's actually happening in these uh, in these analyses. Some morbidity endpoints for a coronary event, stroke, and lung cancer. Significant positive findings for stroke with all three pollutants. Uh, significant findings for NO2 and coronary events, lung cancer, and PM2.5. And positive effect estimates, but not significantly so for the other pollutants. And again, uh, negative effect estimates for ozone, but for stroke and lung cancer, not, not, no more reaching statistical significance, as you can see. As the COPD, this was restricted to data from the four, uh, uh, from, from the Danish and Swedish cohorts. And here we, we found uh, very strong um, associations with, with asthma, COPD, and all three pollutants highlighted in yellow. And not much of an association, really, especially for COPD and ozone, as you can see from the bottom line in the, in the table. So some take home messages from the pooled cohort, long-term exposure to PM2.5, NO2, and black carbon was positively associated with morbidity and mortality in the pooled cohort. The concentration response functions tended to be steeper at low concentrations. Associations remained at low concentrations below 10 or 12 micrograms per meter cube PM2.5, below 20 micrograms per meter cube NO2, which clearly supports the new air quality guidelines, which we will be hearing about more later this afternoon from the Rota Jarosinski. And the negative associations with ozone uh, were essentially explained by cohort and co-pollutant confounding in, in the pooled uh, cohort. I'd like to acknowledge the help and support from the HGI uh, funding, which is very important for this study. We have a large collaborative group. I won't read out all the names to you. We were fortunate to have a group meeting uh, just two weeks ago, a hybrid meeting with uh, more than half of the group showing up in Utrecht. And you can see all happy faces for being able to finally get together again. And also happy faces on the screen for those who were forced to uh, participate remotely. So. Uh, Thanks to all of these folks who, without whom it wouldn't have been possible to do this, uh, this extensive study. You can't read this slide probably very well, but uh, we so far we've published 15 papers out of ELAPS. And if you can look at the slides later on when they become available, you can look at uh, the detailed preferences for all of these. And a couple more are still in the way. Uh, so we will be publishing more about this study in, in the near future. That's all for now. Thank you for listening to this part of the presentation on the pulled cohort. And Massimo Stafoggia will take over to present the results of the uh, uh, administrative cohorts. Thank you, Bert. Um, and congratulations on getting 15 papers out um, so quickly. That's wonderful. Uh, and of course, the pictures uh, from the European teams are always the most endearing. Um, I want to move on to our next speaker, as Bert suggested, um, uh, Massimo Stafoggia. Uh, and I should begin by introducing him formally. He graduated uh, in statistical sciences and took a master of biostatistics, biostatistics at the Harvard School of Public Health and also holds a PhD from the Carolina Institute uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. He is a senior biostatistician at the Department of Epi Epidemiology in the Lazio Region Health Service in Italy. He's contributed to the planning and implementation of many environmental epidemiology studies at the Italian and the European level aimed at investigating the relationships between environmental exposures and adverse health outcomes and the identification of vulnerable population subgroups. He is also the co-author of more than 150 scientific papers published in international journals. And as Bert mentioned, he will speak on the administrative uh, cohort in ELAPS. Welcome, Massimo. It's yours. The screen is yours. That's great. You might be on mute. I, I believe you're on mute. Mm, trouble hearing you.
Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm sorry. No problem. So good, okay, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's a, a great privilege for me to be here and have the opportunity to present the latest results of the ELAPS project with regard to the administrative cohorts. In this presentation, I will skip the parts about the study design and the, the, the exposure assessment and the analytical strategy because that has been already covered in the previous presentation. I will uh, rather focus on the following aspects. Specifically, I will present uh, the, uh, the, the association between air pollution and mortality in cost-specific mortality in the seven large administrative cohorts of Europe. I will uh, present some results about the exposure response functions with a focus uh, at the low extremes of the exposure distribution. And then I will focus uh, the attention on the two pollutant models to check the robustness of the main results to co-pollutant adjustment. And finally, I will present some novel results on the indirect adjustment uh, because we already heard previously about the limitation of the administrative cohorts in terms of uh, availability of uh, uh, individual level covariates. So it is important here to show how much estimates change if we uh, adjust or not by uh, smoking and, uh, and BMI. So uh, briefly, some words about, uh, about the cohorts. It has been already mentioned that we included in this analysis uh, seven cohorts from, uh, from Europe of different sites. You can see from uh, approximately 1.5 million subjects in the Roman and English cohort up to more than 8 million subjects in the Dutch cohort. For a total of uh, more than 28 million uh, participants with complete data on uh, exposure and, uh, and covariates. Uh, we will see in the next slide the availability of uh, individual level and area level uh, confounders we were able to, to collect. And in terms of analytical strategy, differently from what was done in the pooled cohort, here the cohorts were analyzed individually, meaning that uh, each cohort uh, analyst analyzed its own data, and then only the results were pooled into a, a, a random effect meta-analysis. So this is a, a, an overview of the uh, uh, individual level and area level covariates, which were available for the seven cohorts. You can see that for some of the co covariates were available in all the cohorts, such as age and sex. Some others like education level, occupation status, uh, and the marital status were available in most of the cohorts. While in some, some other covariates, like uh, a, for example, county of origin, mother tongue, et cetera, were available only in a few of them. As I said at the beginning, uh, uh, smoking status and BMI were available only in one cohort, in the English cohort. For all the other cohorts, we had to rely on the indirect adjustment methods, as we will see at the end of the, of the presentation. However, we also supplemented the uh, information from uh, area level confounders aimed at capturing the contextual characteristics of the uh, residential area of the participants in terms of both income, education, unemployment rate, uh, ethnicity, and the socioeconomic score indices. In total, we analyzed uh, almost three point, uh, more than 3.5 million beds for a total of uh, almost 260,000 a million, uh, so 260 million uh, person yards. So this is a, an overview of the exposures uh, in, in the seven in the seven cohorts, where we can see, uh, as in the previous uh, presentation, we also here have a, a, a clear north to south gradient in terms of uh, exposures with the higher levels in southern uh, Europe cohorts and the smaller concentrations in the Scandinavian cohorts, such as the Norwegian and the Danish cohorts. Specifically, the Norwegian cohorts contributed with a lot of uh, uh, information below 10 micrograms per cubic meter, where most of, of the other, some of the other cohorts had information also uh, below 12, and most of them below 15 micrograms per cubic meter. For N2, again, we see the same north to south gradient, but also as in the case for, for the pool cohorts, we see a lot of uh, exposure variability within cohort, uh, as it is depicted by the, the sides of, of the boxes uh, for, for each cohort. 
So I, I will start now with presenting some uh, uh, results about the, the association between the four air pollutants and co-specific mortality from single pollutant models uh, uh, where model where air pollutant was entered as a, as a linear term. So in this case, you can easily see a, a significant and positive associations between PN2.5, NO2, black carbon with all the, the study outcomes with estimates which are somewhat higher for lung cancer mortality. And again, as was the case for the pooled cohort, here we see a, a negative association with ozone that we will comment later in the presentation. In the next couple of slides, I will present some cohort-specific results, just to give the, 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 let's say, the idea of the uh, heterogeneous results across cohorts. In this case, you can see that all the seven cohorts presented the positive associations between PN2.5 and mortality, although some of the cohorts, for example, the Danish one, present at much higher effect estimates. A similar picture is for NO2, where you can see again, uh, uh, six out of seven cohorts with positive associations. The only exception being the Belgian cohort, which had basically a null association. And again, uh, the Danish cohort presented a, a, a higher uh, estimate compared to the others. In these two plots here, we present uh, the results of, the, of, our, of our meta smoothing approach, where basically what we did was to analyze uh, the exposure response function, function between uh, the two pollutants and uh, mortality uh, using natural splines within each cohort. And then we meta-analyzed the, the cohort specific uh, shapes. And what we can see here on the left side is the relationship between PN2.5 and the mortality. And we see a steeper slope at lowest concentrations. And then the relationship tend to become less steep uh, with the highest values of PN2.5. And the similar uh, shape we can see with the NO2 with much steeper associations below 20 micrograms per cubic meter, but even below. 10, and then the relationship tend to flatten out after uh, some higher threshold. Uh, this is the situation when we, uh, uh, we inspect the cohort specific exposure response function. So what you can see here is the same plots for each cohort. In this case, uh, this, these uh, curves are from the natural splines that we have fitted in, 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 in each cohort. And the uh, green ellipsis represents the, 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 the parts of the, of the uh, let's say, of the cohorts where we have more support from the data. So basically the, the, the parts of the curve with the, the, uh, the, the confidence intervals uh, more narrow. And basically what we can observe here is that uh, although the, the, the slope of the relationship is uh, uh, steeper in some cases and less steep in others, but still we see an increasing uh, uh, gradient in the relationship in all the, seven, in all the seven cohorts. Interestingly, most are the Danish and the Norwegian cohort, which contribute with the PN2.5 concentrations well below 10 micrograms per cubic meter. And we can appreciate that at the very low levels of exposure, the relationship is uh, uh, basically linear and very steep. This is the same plot for NO2 and, uh, and mortality in the seven cohort. Again, uh, we are highlighting in the ellipsis the parts of the, of the data with the more uh, uh, information. And again, we can see more or less in all cohorts uh, uh, linear or supralinear association with a steeper slope at the lowest levels of exposure. Uh, these are the results of the subset analysis, uh, which parallel those the presented in the, in, the previous, in the previous presentation for the, for the pooled cohort. There are several aspects of this table, which uh, I think are important to, to highlight. First of all, the number of cohorts contributing to the different ranges of exposure. We can see, as I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, that all the cohorts contribute with some data below 15 micrograms per cubic meter for a total of almost 10 million subjects below that threshold. 
and six out of seven cohorts, basically all of them except the Rome cohort, contribute with some data below 12, while only four cohorts have data below 10, but for a total of almost 2 million subjects. And uh, we can see uh, that the relationship uh, uh, is, uh, uh, the, the more down we go in the distribution, uh, the, the hazard ratios in, in, increase. So basically we confirm uh, an adverse association of air pollution at the very low levels uh, of exposure, which is what was originally hypothesized in the project. So the project seems to be very informative in producing evidence at the very low extreme of the distribution. And the similar picture is for NO2. In this case, the seven cohort, all of them contribute with some uh, information below 20 microgram per cubic meter for a total of almost 6 million subjects and an hazard ratio which is higher than the one that we can see on the full data set. This is just a zoom of the two cohorts which contribute with most of the data below the, the predefined threshold. And we can see here the same picture with the persistent effects of very low concentrations of both PM2.5 and NO2 in both the Danish and the Norwegian cohort. This is a summary of the two pollutant results. So the meta-analytical results in the seven uh, administrative cohorts. And for comparison purposes, we are also reporting in the second column also the single pollutant the hazard ratios. And what we can see here is that NO2 effects were uh, totally stable and robust to co-pollutant adjustment. So the hazard ratios do not change at all. Uh, either we adjust for PN2.5 or we adjust for black carbon, whereas PN2.5 and black carbon hazard ratios basically become one once we adjust for NO2. Uh, if we focus the attention on the PN2.5 and NO2 uh, two pollutant results, we, we can see here on the left the correlations between the two pollutants within the seven cohorts. We can see quite high correlations, in some cases very high, like in the Norwegian or in the Rome cohort. And uh, when we compare the single pollutant and uh, the two pollutant results of PN2.5 adjusted for NO2, we can see that uh, apart the Belgian cohort, in all other cases, there is a strong attenuation of, of the effect. Once we adjust for NO2, basically we see a drop in the uh, hazard ratios of mortality for PN2.5. In a couple of cohorts, the, 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 the association remains significant, the Danish and the Norwegian, whereas in all the other ones, basically it approaches unity. And finally, before, before moving to the, to the final remarks, I think this is important to show the results of the indirect adjustment we performed in the six cohort, which did not, did not have information on smoking and BMI. So basically what we did here was to supplement uh, uh, the data with the six surveys in the same study areas. Surveys for which we did have uh, data on smoking and BMI. So in those surveys, we quantified the relationship between uh, air pollutants and uh, smoking and BMI. And we used that information to, indir to indirectly adjust uh, the effect estimates we had uh, found uh, in, the, in the administrative cohorts. And what it is interesting to show here is that uh, uh, we do not see a, a, a strong uh, uh, attenuation of the effects. So actually, in some cases, there is an, incre an increment in the hazard ratio after indirect adjustment for smoking and BMI. This is, for example, the case for the Rome cohort and for the Belgian cohort. And the reason is that uh, in those uh, surveys, the relationship between uh, uh, air pollutants and the smoking and BMI were, were, were negative, even after adjustment for the other uh, confounders. So very, very briefly, uh, some uh, discussion points. It's just a summary of the main results we just, uh, we just saw. We saw that virtually all subjects had PN2.5 and NO2 average exposures below the EO limit values but also a large fraction of the study population had, had the PN2.5 
uh, the exposures below the US standards and the WHO guideline values. We found significant positive associations between PN2.5, NO2, and black carbon with co-specific mortality. And when we inspected the concentration response functions, although it differed somewhat between cohorts, most of the associations were generally linear to supralinear with no indication of a level below which no associations were found. Uh, the same picture was, uh, uh, came out from the subset analysis, which documented that these associations remained at the low levels. So below 10 micrograms per cubic meter, PN2.5 and 2NT for NO2. For the two pollutants, as we uh, briefly uh, presented before, BC and the NO2 remained significantly associated with mortality after adjustment for PN2.5, whereas the PN2.5 hazard ratios reduced the unity in two pollutant uh, models with, uh, with NO2. And finally, uh, the indirect adjustment for smoking and BMI basically confirmed the main findings. We didn't see uh, a clear attenuation of the associations after indirect adjustment for these covariates. So to conclude, uh, uh, just a few strengths and limitations of the whole ELAPS project, not just the administrative cohort part. The major strengths were the, the, the collection of data from multiple cohorts uh, with detailed information on individual level covariates, which was paralleled by uh, information by large administrative cohorts and the service which allowed uh, uh, indirect adjustment for uh, uh, smoking and BMI. The, the exposure assessment was done centrally uh, with a, a standardized protocol, uh, which produced uh, very finely resolved uh, estimates at 100 meter resolution. And also another key aspect was the availability for each participant in the, in the old cohorts of the uh, coordinates of the residential address. Finally, uh, we uh, developed uh, common analytical scripts centrally and we distributed them uh, to the cohort analysts. As the limitations, uh, we already mentioned them. Most of the subjects uh, were exposed to uh, PN 2.5 concentrations above 10 micrograms per cubic meter. And especially for the administrative cohorts, we had uh, uh, missing lifestyle data although indirect adjustment made no major difference. And the take home messages are basically a very, very similar to the ones that uh, Professor Brunegraft previously presented. Long-term exposure to PN2.5, NO2 and black carbon was positively associated with morbidity and mortality in both pooled and administrative cohorts. Hazard ratios for PN2.5 were somewhat larger in the pooled cohorts compared to the administrative ones, but in both cases, associations remained at the very low levels with exposure response curves, which showed steeper slopes at the low exposures with no evidence of, of a threshold. Finally, negative associations with ozone were largely explained by cohort selection in the pooled cohorts and by co-pollutant co confounding, both in the pooled and in the administrative courts. And with that, I again present uh, the, the list of papers for your reference, and I thank this, the ELAPS uh, consortium and you all for your attention. Thank you, Massimo, for that very nice and concise presentation. Um, we appreciate it. And thank you so much for taking it. We're keeping to time with both you and Bert, which leaves us about 15 minutes for some questions and answers, which is quite wonderful. Um, I wanted to, um, I'll begin and we'll alternate, I'll alternate with my co-chair uh, asking Q&A. Um, I thought I'd begin with a question that was answered in the, um, in the chat very briefly, but it seems relevant. Um, and that goes uh, to the, Bal the Balkan region uh, as the first question. Um, is the Balkan region included in monitoring and in the studies? And what are the findings for the Balkans? And, and Bert said, um, not necessarily so. Um, but I did want to ask how you see these study results as relevant in other regions in Europe that were not necessarily um, direct uh, parts of the study, particularly areas like that where levels can also be very high as well as very low. 
Well, if I may, in, in the absence of data, that's a, that's a hard question uh, mm -hmm. to answer, obviously. We did have uh, one or two Eastern European partners in Escape, if I remember correctly, that didn't make much of a difference in terms of the effects, but I would need to go back to those papers and, and take another close look. Um, I did show the map of the, um, the airbase monitoring, and I don't recall whether airbase is covering the Balkans as well. It may, that may be the case, but if you look at the map, the, the, if there are measuring stations, monitoring stations in the Balkans, they should show up on that map. Thank you, Bert. <clears throat> thank you, Bert. Thank you, Bert. And thanks, Rob. I will also pull out some questions from the audience. And Antonio Gasparini says, thanks to Bert and Massimo for great presentations. And brings an important question. Uh, do you have a hypothesis about a difference between the analysis of the two sets of cohorts, traditional and administrative, you can notice apparently a higher heterogeneity in the later. Can it be due to residual <coughs> confounding in the later? I don't know if Massimo or Bert wants to start answering uh, this important question. Yes, uh, I can start. Uh, of course, there are differences between the pooled and administrative cohort results. There are indeed differences even within administrative cohorts. And we, of course, have uh, interpretations of these differences. Uh, we believe that, uh, first of all, populations are different. I mean, if you look at the distribution of the covariates in the pool cohorts and in the administrative cohorts, they are not the same. So there are different uh, uh, populations with different characteristics. Uh, so which would increase, of course, the, the, the chance of finding heterogeneous results. Despite that, uh, I would say that we do not see conflicting uh, results between pooled and administrative cohorts. As also Bert presented before, once you start you know, uh, trying to, for example, using baseline exposures, I mean, you're starting uh, uh, trying to reduce the potential sources of the heterogeneity by making uh, the two sets more comparable in terms of the kind of exposure you use, et cetera, you see that the results tend to align quite a bit. So I wouldn't put it in terms of uh, residual confounding, also because uh, the administrative cohorts, it is true that they do not have information on uh, some covariates, but uh, we showed that the indirect adjustment made no difference at all. We showed that uh, adjustment for those covariates or not adjustment in the pooled analysis didn't make a, a, a big difference uh, at all. And also we have a lot of individual and area level covariates, which in a way should uh, uh, capture most of the potential confounding. So I, I wouldn't uh, be too much worried of uh, large residual confounding. Yeah, and if I may add to that, if you look at the results of the indirect adjustment, it actually explains some of the heterogeneity between the cohort effects because the effect estimates become closer together after the indirect adjustment. If you look at uh, one of the tables that Massimo has showed. Also a concern with the administrative cohorts often is that because you don't have information on smoking, et cetera, that you may be overestimating the, the effects. If you compare the pooled cohorts uh, with the administrative cohorts in the labs, you actually see the opposite. The effect estimates in the pooled co in the administrative cohorts tend to be a little smaller than the ones in the pooled cohorts. So that goes against the often uh, mentioned hypothesis that the administrative cohorts are uh, overestimating the effects. Thank you both. Um, I would just make a quick note that a couple of the questions that have come in um, seem a little bit more well suited to panelists uh, uh, in the, the next session. So uh, we're not ignoring you, we'll just hold them till then. Um, uh, the question from Sabina Lang, um, how do you interpret the Belgian and Swiss administrative cohorts meta smoothing ER functions for PM 2.5, where all the hazard ratio functions are below one? Okay, this is an interesting question. Uh, Actually, if we look at those plots, uh, uh, as I've presented before, it is true that there are parts of the, of the curve where the relationship goes down, but it, that is the part with less information. The confidence bands are very, very wide. If we focus the attention, that was the purpose of putting those uh, 
circles around the most informative section of the data. If you look at, at, the, at the section of the data where we do have information, the relationship becomes, becomes positive. The fact that uh, in, the, in the plot, uh, the hazard ratios in the first part uh, were below one, it, it, they are simply because the reference point in those plots was the minimum value, which was when uh, the information was little and the curve started to decrease. But I think that rather than commenting the, the, the let's say the, the y-axis of, uh, of those curves, we should comment the, the shape of the curve, especially in the part of the curve where we do have information. And in that part, we still see a positive increasing hazard ratio. Thank you. And if I may add to that, if I may add to that, uh, when we develop the air quality guidelines, as Dorota will be telling you about in more detail later, we actually said that we would focus on those parts of the exposure response curves, which were above the fifth percentile of the distributions. If you would look at the, uh, what happens below the fifth percentiles of the distributions in elapsed, now you will see some of the heterogeneity that uh, Massimo was referring to and, and has shown. So I think that supports the choice that we made in, in WHO air quality guideline revision. Do not uh, focus too much on the, the very lowest part of the, of the exposure response curves because of the uncertainty related to the sparseness of the data. Thank you both. Uh, we have received several questions commenting the concentration response functions presented in both speeches. Uh, one attendee says, as many as I am, surprised by higher hazard ratios in the lower concentrations. I'm also curious about lower HR using back extrapolate exposure estimates. What's your explanation? This is to Bert, but I guess it's both relevant for both talks. Well, if you go to the back extrapolated concentrations, those are higher than the the, the later concentrations that we that we used for the two, for the year two thousand ten. And then it's a simple question of mathematics. If you have you have if you have a certain effect that is being expressed over a smaller range, you get a bigger effect estimate per unit mass than when you express that same effect over a larger range. So it's simply a matter of uh, increasing the concentrations at, at, the, at the baseline levels, which uh, must lead to a smaller effect estimate, also all other things being equal. Great, thank you. Um, uh, for Bert, thanks for a nice presentation. <laughs> As many, uh, I am surprised by the higher um, hazard response in lower concentrations. I'm also curious about the lower HR using back extrapolated exposure estimates. Um, what is your explanation? And I'm wondering if this could be due to the fact that usually back extrapolated estimates are higher. Well, that was the point that we just discussed, I think, from the back yeah. extrapolated uh, concentrations. Uh, the the, the non-linearity of the concentration response function is, is more high, difficult not to crack, I think. There was a question that I briefly answered in, in the, the Q&A already, suggesting that we might be looking at uh, a saturation phenomena at higher concentrations, but that's uh, speculative at this point, I think. Mm -hmm. We see this um, non-linearity in many exposure response functions for not only for air pollution, but also for other pollutants. We see it for the long term, we see it for the short term concentrations. We had this beautiful series of papers from Antonio Gasparini who's on, on, on the call as well, from the, uh, um, the, the MCC multi-city, multi-country studies, which all show uh, decreasing effect estimates or less steep effect estimates at higher concentrations. So it's it's fairly universal phenomenon, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's easily explained. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. For Massimo Staforgia, could you expand on why the PM2.5 and black carbon hazard ratio essentially became one in the two pollutant model when adjusted for NO2? In contrast, NO2 hazard ratio seem unaffected when adjusted for PM2.5 and black carbon. And the first presentation had contrasting results. So can you com comment a little bit on these two pollutant results? Okay, sure. Of course, we have some interpretations of these results. Of course, we do not believe that PN2.5 has no effect because it drops to one after 
And to adjustment, we simply think that uh, the two exposures are co collinear, as we saw, they have correlations above 0.6 in most of the cohorts, meaning that uh, when you adjust one for the other, basically, uh, you, you basically the, the, the part of expo of PN 2.5, which is not related anymore, makes it has more to do with secondary particles, where, whereas uh, our interpretation is that the common sources to NO2, PN 2.5 and black carbon, which has combustion uh, particles, primary sources, vehicular traffic, etc., they are the ones which are showing the highest effect. Why NO2 uh, comes out more than PN 2.5? Uh, difficult to say. Possibly that's a better proxy for those sources. So this is our, our speculation. Uh, but uh, the fact that, uh, I mean, the fact that in the pool cohort uh, that doesn't uh, happen uh, can be due to several things, different study populations, or maybe in, in those pooled cohorts, PN 2.5. Uh, are a good proxy for primary particles. So uh, it's, it's difficult to draw uh, conclusions out of that, but our uh, idea is that the mixture of these pollutants, what they are representing is uh, a key for, for, for health. And maybe to add to that, um, the administrative cohorts with the exception of the Rome cohort are essentially nationwide cohorts. So they cover uh, low concentrations and sparsely populated areas in the participating countries as well. Whereas the pooled cohort with one or two exceptions is mostly urban cohorts. So there is a difference potentially in the, the sources contributing to the mix between these two uh, settings. Uh, I think it's interesting to note that in the Canadian experience also, if you adjust for NO2, uh, there's, there's a big reduction in the PM2.5 effect, if I remember correctly. But you have to be very careful in interpreting these uh, two pollutant models, as Massimo said, because the, because of the sometimes high correlation between the two. Thank you. We have time for a few more questions. This is wonderful. Um, the effect of, um, of five micrograms of uh, per meter squared of PM 2.5 on lung cancer shown by BERT is the same as the one shown by Pope et al. in JAMA 2002, but referring to 10 micrograms of PM 2.5. Uh, any comment on why the difference? Well, this factor of two difference between two completely different studies is not too surprising, I think. If you look at the, the, the many meta-analyses that have been conducted in recent years for PM 2.5, and mortality and other endpoints, NO2 and mortality. Now, they show that differences of, of a factor of two between effect estimates are the rule rather than the exception. There is some heterogeneity. And it probably doesn't make too much sense in trying to explain the exact difference between one study to another study conducted in very different time scales, very different uh, differences, settings. So I think uh, I'd rather suggest that we should not be too surprised by factor, by differences in effect estimates of no more than a factor of two. Thank you. Um, Stephanie Butto says, thanks to both of you for nice presentations. I was wondering if you could discuss the spatial resolution of exposure models, the magnitude of the exposure error and how this um, many result in, may result in heterogeneity and bias in the estimated response functions. Many thanks. Yeah, this is a question that was raised in the reviews of some of our papers, also by, by reviewers and, and journal editors. Um, if you look at the, um, the exposure papers that we produced, they all they do have a lot of uh, validation information for the different components, whereas it, the, the, the validation uh, R squares are somewhat somewhat different between the different components they're not dramatically different. So our feeling is that, you know, the, the, it, it's a good question, but we don't have strong information to suggest that we are misspecifying one pollutant much more than the other. And, that's, and, that, and that, that explains the, the, what's happening in the, in the two pollutant analyses or in the analyses uh, overall. Thank you. I think time for two more questions uh, and then we'll move on because we have a lot more to go today. Um, both of them on ozone 
at least one, these from me are two on ozone and, and, uh, and we can have one more after that. The two on ozone basically ask, uh, it's surprising that there was a finding of a negative correlation between ozone and traffic pollutants. And secondly, the results on ozone seem strange to me. How should one justify measures to lower ozone precursors if ozone has a positive health effect? And of course, ozone has both acute and long-term effects, so that's not an unimportant factor. Yeah, I don't think ozone has a positive health effect in, in our study, as uh, both Massimo and I have shown. If you, if you do careful sensitivity analysis, the ozone negative association with ozone uh, pretty much disappears. We do have a situation in which um, at the 100 by 100 meter scale exposure assessment that we do, there is a strong negative association, especially between NO2 and black carbon on the one hand and ozone on the other hand, which we don't really see, I think, across the uh, the ocean where the, the, the situation is apparently uh, different. The ranges of ozone concentrations within countries and within cohorts in Europe is also small compared to the North American studies, which makes it difficult to uh, to find effects of ozone given the small exposure ranges. But at this point, I think we are pretty confident that there is no protective association with ozone in view of the sensitivity analysis that we've done. Uh, at the same time, we don't see in our data a positive association with ozone. And uh, that is different from the situation in, in Canada and, 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 and the United States. But I do need to emphasize again that we have these strong negative correlations with uh, NO2 and uh, black carbon. And there's actually one example of a study from Denmark using the same health data, but another exposure model than, than we have uh, used. It actually shows that after adjustment for NO2, the negative uh, single polluted association with ozone that they found actually changed to a positive association. But again, in a situation with a very strong negative correlation between NO2 and ozone. So that's more to explore when it comes to ozone in Europe, for sure. Thank you, Bert. Um, to Massimo Stafogia from N.A. Johannesson, uh, thank you for sharing exciting results. Do you have any explanation for why the effects of air pollution, exposure, or mortality was strikingly higher in Danish data than in other countries? Mm -hmm. Underlying lifestyle, different backgrounds, other things. Then Joseph Cyrus had similar question, why the results between Denmark and Belgium differ so much, if you have some explanation. Uh this is a good question <laughs> more for our chair here <laughs> uh, no it's, it, as i said at the beginning it's quite difficult to to find uh, uh, exhaustive explanations of why uh, results in the in the danish results are so so strong uh, uh, it can be uh, so it, it is just uh, speculations it can be a, a matter of uh, of uh, population characteristics uh, but uh, it is difficult to, to, to find a, a biological explanation of that. I would rather say it has to do with the population composition in the Danish cohort. But of course, that yeah. will be, I'm sure it will be further investigated by our Danish colleagues. Zorana. And again, if you, if you look at the, the effect of indirect adjustment, that, that actually uh, makes the difference between the Danish findings and the other findings less. It's, it's still there. But it, it looks like it may have something to do with uh, the unavailability of certain covariates in one country compared to another, and the difference in the relationship between things like smoking and air pollution, which which may be different in different countries. Thank you uh, both. We need to end here, although it's quite clear from the questions we could go on with this for quite a long time. So we really appreciate your insight. Um, it's time to move on to the second portion of our, our webinar, uh, what are the risk assessment and policy decisions to be informed? And you've been speaking with uh, Zorana Anderson, but I just wanted to say a little bit more about her who will be chairing this session. She's professor of environmental epidemiology at the Department of Public Health at the University of Copenhagen, but she's also the chair of the European Respiratory, Respiratory Society on, on the Environment and Health Committee and has a very long and rich portfolio of research and capacity building. Uh, in uh, in Serbia and Western Balkans, among others. So uh, it's a great person to chair this session. Sarana. Thank you very much, Bob. And uh, I would like to, uh, yeah, 
uh, reflect a little bit on the great results from the lab studies. Uh, also as a chair of Environment Health Committee at European Respiratory Society, we are with great, great interest waited for these results. And I think also uh, seeing that the results of a lab study shows again that uh, some of the health effects seem to be strong as for respiratory disease. And we've seen both in pooled and, and uh, administrative cohorts that results from lung cancer were some of the strongest associations as well as, as well as very strong associations reported for asthma COPD. This is something that we see um, with, with great interest, uh, this new evidence to show that uh, air pollution policy needs to take this very seriously, especially for respiratory patients. With this, we will take the discussion to the next uh, part of the webinar to reflect more on what these results can do for upcoming policy. And I will, we will start with a presentation uh, uh, by Mikhail Krizanovsky and then open up for a panel discussion. And with this, I will first introduce Mikhail, who will talk about what are the risk assessment and policy discussions to be informed. Mikhail Krizanovsky is also a well-known name. He's environmental epidemiologist, currently holding a position as a visiting professor at the School of Public Health and Imperial College in London. He's very active as an expert and consultant for WHO, UN Environment and other organizations, as he's been a member and a co-chair of the WHO Guideline Development Group and a member of Health Effects Institute Global Health Oversight Committee. With this, Mikkel, I will give the word to you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. I try to share my, uh, sorry, my screen, but not this one. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I was asked to briefly comment on what are the risk assessment and policy decisions to be informed by the uh, uh, LAP study. And indeed, uh, we do have a lot of messages uh, coming from this uh, uh, very interesting and innovative uh, study. Uh, first, uh, I want to show again the pictures of the exposure response uh, or the concentration response functions, which you have seen. You have seen more of those functions, but very important message coming from them is that uh, both for PM2.5 and NO2, there is a significant decrease in the risk to mortality and other health outcomes when you go down with the concentrations, go down far lower than, than the previous air quality guidelines and to reaching current air quality guidelines. And this for both pollutants, especially for NO2, for which uh, the previous guidelines were basically at the edge of the distribution of uh, exposures observed in, uh, in, the, in the study. So uh, it, why it is important uh, for European policy making, very important aspect is the European uh, population covered by uh, Elapse study. The air quality guidelines, uh, those new air quality guidelines, uh, uh, used the uh, evidence from all over the world. And the lowest studies, uh, I mean, studies conducted with the lowest concentrations used in air quality guidelines were those from Canada and United States. So now, uh, Elapse is joining this set of studies showing that the situation with the drop of risk, health risk in lower concentrations down to the new air quality guidelines is also observed, is also confirmed in Europe. So there is no reason why European, uh, European air quality should be uh, higher than uh, or should be worse uh, than in uh, the United States or the other places. Everywhere we will drop the pollution 
in highly polluted places and low polluted places in Europe, there will be health gain. Um, for NO2, the message is the same and even more ambitious, I would say, because most of population is uh, living in places where NO2 uh, levels are exceeded quite significantly in Europe. And a lapse study in this case is uh, uh, N4 is, is strengthening the message from air quality guidelines review uh, in which three out of five lower lower, lower studies were actually from Europe. So here we have just uh, strengthening of this message and amplification of it. There was a lot of discussion, uh, also questions about the risk function uh, or risk functions produced by ELAPS. Here I used a um, combination of various tables from BIRDS uh, from ELAPS report. Um, just so summarizing the risk uh, coefficients uh, from the ELAPS study, from the pool cohort, and uh, administrative cohort with other low level studies conducted recently, as well as with the results of meta analysis done independently, by the way, by two teams on PM levels and uh, another uh, conducted for air quality guidelines review uh, on NO2. Uh, you see that the risk uh, coefficients uh, estimated in those uh, meta-analyses uh, are slightly different than those from individual studies. This is obvious, as it was said before, that each of the study, in case of meta-analysis, uh, each of more than 30 studies included in meta-analysis. Well, in each study, there are different methods, different population studies. Uh, question is which of those uh, risk coefficients to be used in future health risk assessment. My preference would be to go for meta-analytic uh, results uh, rather than for individual standard results. But this is certainly something which has to be um, intensively discussed. Another point I want to re-emphasize also using the results of the new study from far away, from New Zealand, which was showing basically the same results as ELAPS. What is interesting here and what has to be emphasized is that all population in New Zealand lives in rather high air quality or low pollution levels as for Europe. The mean values are shown here on the slide. Uh, the point is that uh, similarly as in the um, ELAPS study, when the PM effects were adjusted for uh, NO2, the effects were slightly attenuated, but it was not happening uh, when NO2 effects were, at, uh, were adjusted for PM2.5. When we look at a elapsed study, again, those tables were shown uh, before, uh, we had this attenuation for PM both in pooled cohort and uh, administra administrative cohort for PM, but not for NO2. Uh, conclusion here for a health risk assessment is that, well, now we should start using uh, NO2 uh, effects more intensively and also uh, use a two pollutant model uh, for uh, accounting for possible double counting. Uh, as mentioned before, the B uh, black carbon effect disappears when adjusted for NO2. Well, uh, this is also something which has to be uh, studied uh, more. Uh, as discussed in the question and answer uh, session, uh, black carbon might be here indicator of the same type of pollution, the same type of emissions 
as NO2. So probably studies conducted in places where black carbon is coming from other sources and transport would be uh, quite beneficial for uh, deepening knowledge on this uh, topic. So in conclusion to this, my, uh, to this uh, short presentation is that well, I believe that a lab study fully supports policies aiming at uh, aiming at reaching air quality guidelines level from 2021 uh, for PM 2.5 and uh, NO2. Uh, for health risk assessment, um, I would think that at this moment we can do a health risk assessment with a risk coefficient from meta-analysis. Um, we note this uh, observation uh, of steeper slope uh, at low PM 2.5 levels is then in higher, which is also shown in other low level studies, those coming from Canada and the uh, United States. Um, I believe the two pollutant analysis should be done for PM 2.5 and NO2. And responding to one of the questions in NO2, yes, current uh, reference level or cutoff level used by EA of 20 is, uh, I would say, obsolete. Looking at current uh, evidence, we should go with much lower levels like uh, 10 for NO2 in health risk assessment. Um, but overall, I think it is time um, to reconsider all this new accumulated evidence uh, to, uh, to develop strong recommendations uh, and methodology for using uh, information on concentration response functions in health in, in impact assessment, exploring both heterogeneity of the uh, results from various studies and also the shapes uh, of concentration and response function. And the last point is about the black carbon. I think it is time to uh, also to implement uh, one of the good practice statements uh, from uh, the new guidelines uh, and um, analyze a specific role of uh, black carbon um, independently perhaps uh, of NOx um, uh, as indicator of uh, harmful pollution. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miko, for giving this nice overview of the comparison of a lab's results in the context of the other recent analysis from the similar projects from Canada and US, as well as recent meta-analysis. Um, and this set and for setting the stage for upcoming panel discussion. I'm very pleased that we have a four panelists today that will reflect more on, on importance of these results and, and uh, need um, for our policy upcoming policy at EU level, and also with some reflections on, on, on the uh, situation in the US. Um, I will, uh, we have four panelists, Roto Jarosinska from WHO, Anna Stauker from Health and Environment Alliance, Tom Lubin from US Environmental Protection Agency, and Thomas Heinrich from European Commission. And uh, we will start with Dorota Jarosinska, who will take us back in time two weeks and present again new WHO air quality guidelines. Um, and I would like to introduce Dorota while she's preparing her slides. Uh, Dorota Yarosinska is a medical doctor specialist in public health who is currently uh, working at the WHO European Center for Environment and Health in Bonn, where she manages program on living and working environments, which covers diverse portfolio, including the health aspects of air quality and climate change mitigation, chemical safety, environmental noise, environmental sustainable health systems and occupational health. She was also coordinating the project on updating the WHO Global Air Quality Guidelines, and she will briefly in five minutes tell us about that. The floor is yours, Dorota. Uh, thank you very much, Dorana. Um, dear colleagues, uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity to once again uh, present the, the, the highlights of the air quality guidelines. And in fact, this very webinar really provides a very special context to, to um, representing the, the guidelines because it is demonstrating how fast research is developing. We launched the guidelines a few weeks ago 
uh, e, they are based on the very robust and comprehensive assessment of the evidence, and we are seeing new large scale, new results coming from large scale studies, reinforcing the messages coming from the guidelines. So just very briefly to most likely remind uh, the participants, what are the new air quality guidelines? First of all, this is a set of these WHO recommendations for the six, these classical air pollutants. So PM 2.5, PM 10, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and carbon monoxide. The <clears throat> guidelines uh, in uh, most cases provide the new air quality guideline levels, which are lower than those that uh, were um, included in the guidelines uh, published in uh, 2006. And you can see the listing of the air quality guideline levels. So for PM2.5, um, the annual um, average is now five micrograms uh, per cubic meter. Uh, similarly for PM10, the new air quality guideline level has declined. Uh, also for NO2 from 40 to 10 micrograms uh, per cubic meter. In addition, a new guideline level was introduced for ozone. Peak season, so equivalent of long-term uh, guideline level, as well as short-term 24 hours um, air quality guideline levels for NO2 and SO2. In this edition, we maintained these interim targets that were introduced in the 2005 uh, air quality guidelines, as they proved to be a very useful instrument to help countries and regions struggling, especially those struggling with um, high air pollution to, to take steps uh, towards improving air quality. And the 2005 air quality guideline values became new interim targets. In addition to these air quality guideline levels and interim targets, a novelty is this more qualitative good practice statements. And uh, um, it has already been mentioned by, by Michał in reference to black carbon. The reasoning behind was the following, that for certain types of PMs, black elemental carbon, ultrafine particles, as well as sand and dust uh, storm relevant in, in parts uh, of the world, there is a growing body of evidence, but the evidence which is very diverse, which couldn't be synthesized, and it's insufficient to derive uh, air quality guideline levels. Hence, um, the statements uh, advising on good practices related to monitoring, management, advancement in exposure assessment um, has been proposed, which hopefully, which will help to gain and gather new evidence that in the future would be useful to uh, derive guideline levels also for some of those um, types of particulate matter. Uh, in case of, of black carbon, here the emphasis is on enhancing systematic measurements in addition to existing monitoring systems uh, giving more emphasis uh, to uh, emission inventories, methods to assess exposure, and at the same time, even without uh, having guideline uh, level set, also to take measures to reduce emissions and also those uh, to, to reduce uh, concentrations. Similarly, for ultrafine particles, the, the philosophy is very similar. So with these new guideline levels and good practice statements, uh, they have been to a large extent lowered uh, and may be challenging in some places to implement. However, the new findings like those presented by ELAPS uh, studies and other studies referred to today 
are really re reassuring and reinforcing the need for very committed efforts to substantially improve air quality. And that applies both to countries that already are enjoying uh, decent quality of, uh, of, of the air, not to stop and, and to enhance their efforts, but also those who are struggling still with high air pollution levels. And I would just very briefly like to mention the process behind the new guideline levels, because this is this very robust process involving several groups of experts that gives the confidence in, in these values. Um, as uh, I believe many of you know, all systematic reviews that were commissioned to support the guidelines are published in a uh, peer-reviewed journal in Environment uh, International, that in the process of producing the systematic reviews of evidence, some additional methodological work have been undertaken and completed by the experts involved in the development of the guidelines, uh, and I mean here risk of bias um, assessment tool, as well as certain modification and adjustment to the great framework. So the framework used to assess the, total, the, 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 the quality and the confidence in the evidence reviewed. And then a very thorough um, procedure to really derive the guidelines uh, described in eight steps and applicable both to long-term and short-term air quality guideline levels. Because of the time constraints, I wouldn't go into the details here. They are all described extensively in the guideline document. And in this uh, very short presentation or reminder to many of the key points of air quality guidelines, I am very briefly presenting the incredible work done by the experts involved in the guideline development group in the systematic review team, as well as experts who were members of the external review group. So with this, I would like to thank you and to hand over to Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorota. Um, our next speaker, uh, my pleasure is to introduce Anna Stauffer who is a Deputy Director and Strategic Lead at the Health and Environment Alliance, HEAL. She leads HEAL's activities on climate change, energy and air quality, and provides strategic input for HEAL's organizational development, advocacy, and engagement of stakeholders across the European region. Anna, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Sarana, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speaking to you all this afternoon about the policy implications uh, of the lab study and also the um, WHO gu uh, guidelines that we've just uh, heard about. And I wanted to start by saying that uh, HEAL is an alliance, an umbrella organization of over 90 member organizations from the health community. Uh, and uh, achieving uh, clean air, both outdoors and indoors, has been a core priority for us, uh, you know, and, and the people that we represent. And when we, when we think about the, the implications, I wanted to start by saying that I find the, the results of the lab study quite worrying. They're, they're really adding to the comprehensive body of evidence that we have by now on how air pollution harms our health. And in the past years, we have seen the recognition that air pollution is linked to all the chronic diseases that cause major suffering and major, major health costs uh, across uh, Europe and across the world. So, you know, uh, air pollution is, is a risk factor for cardiovascular, for respiratory disease, for cancer, for diabetes, for obesity. We've also seen many studies that demonstrate the health harm, particularly for children, for children's healthy developments, uh, you know, increasing their risk for disease um, dec decades later in life. Uh, and now with the labs, we have the evidence on um, health harm at uh, low, low levels of air pollution, you know, uh, concentrations where we pre previously thought they were fine. And I think this underlines the fact that uh, there, there is no safe level of air pollution. And consequently, uh, our policies, the measures that we're taking, really have to strive at achieving a zero pollution. 
uh, and you know, really swiftly uh, and significantly reducing uh, the health harm. And when, this, when I think of the, the consequences for policymaking, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, how wide the gap is now between what the science tells us and the actual level of protection uh, in the EU policies, specifically in the EU's uh, ambient air quality directive. Uh, and we know, uh, you know, we've, we've highlighted uh, for, for a longer time that already with the existing uh, directive, there is this gap between the health-based recommendations and between the science. So that was back in 2008. Uh, and by now, this gap has actually widened. It's probably more adequate to speak of a, of a whole canyon now between the science uh, and the legislation. And that's why we're actually uh, pleased and welcome that uh, you know, we're in the process, or the EU is in the process, of uh, revising the ambient um, air quality directives uh, and as part of the Green Deal commitment uh, to, uh, to achieving zero pollution and the zero pollution ambition. With that revision, there is actually a, a huge health promotion and disease prevention potential in the air for hundreds of millions of people. And I think both across the general population, but especially for those who are particularly at risk from um, the harmful effects of poor air quality. And uh, our main demand for this uh, is the full alignment uh, of uh, the EU um, air quality standards with uh, what the WHO recommends and what the latest science shows, including ELAPS. Uh, and I think this is for policymakers if they're serious, or if they take the science seriously, and if they're, you know, if they're committed to protecting people's health, this is actually the only way to go, is the full alignment, uh, and uh, this full alignment to be achieved by 2030. So um, I think with, with all the evidence that we're seeing, it's, it's very clear that there is an urgency to act. It's not about making uh, baby steps anymore. It's really about achieving this, you know, this jump uh, to much, much better health protection and reducing the burden of disease. Uh, and this, this demand, this heal demand is actually supported by many, many across uh, the health community um, and, uh, you know, civil society. Uh, you can find more details on our position on the upcoming revision. Uh, in you know in, in position paper we have a we have a list of ten demands that also includes uh, very importantly policy coherence um, for the new air quality standards that also includes uh, a mechanism to automatically um, update the legislation when new science comes out to ensure that we actually have uh, we don't lose too much too much time between when we new, have new evidence and how that's then then being uptaken. Uh, in, in the policy, uh, but also uh, importantly, um, you know, uh, better information requirements uh, and monitoring um, and also improvements in alert systems. Uh, and for this revision, and sorry, not just, um, one last point I also want to mention, um, we also mustn't forget that, uh, you know, air pollution has no borders. So I think what we're also doing in the EU um, should show some leadership um, also for the European region um, as a whole. And in this revision, the health sector is ready to provide expertise and to advocate so that we swiftly and steeply reduce the uh, current health burden from air pollution, which is unacceptably high. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, for these very important remarks. Uh, with this, I will switch um, to Tom Lubin, who will make some reflections on what's going on in US and um, Elapsed results in the context of recent evidence from US and Tom Lubin is a senior epidemiolo epidemiologist in US Environmental Protection Agency's Center for Public Health and Environmental Assessment. In this role, Tom characterizes the scientific basis for criteria air pollutants leading to the review of national ambient air quality standards and conducts and publishes policy relevant epidemiological studies. So Tom, the board is yours. Thank you very much, Savannah. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And let me first begin by congratulating the ELAPS team for some amazing research, as well as the HEI team for the, the suite of these three studies that I think contribute very valuably to the, to the evidence base. Um, let me begin. So I'm gonna just spend a little bit of time providing some context and, and trying to place some of these results in, into context with the recent evidence for air pollution and health. Um, of course, focusing um, on my perspective from the US EPA 
and my contribution to the recent integrated science assessments that supports our national ambient air quality standards program. And so I want to start today talking about PM 2.5 and mortality. And I've created this forest plot here that places the recent studies funded by HEI, including ELAPS, in context of other North American cohort studies, just so we can kind of see where they fall um, with regard to the mean um, concentration level as well as the results. And so we have the, the pooled results um, and the meta results here uh, using for the meta analytic results or the administrative cohort results. Um, I've placed it here with the, the lowest uh, mean concentration from the, the lowest country. But you can see that the results here fit very nicely um, and are very are quite consistent with other results from North American cohort studies. Um, the results that are presented here in blue are for the Medicare or the US results. Um, so you can see them kind of here in the middle and then the green are the Canadian maple studies down here with the lowest con mean concentrations. Um, but overall, these three large studies really kind of help to flesh out what we've, what we've known to be positive associations between uh, PM2.5 concentrations and all-cause or non-accidental mortality. Um, I do want to, to mention that these results are uh, for the linear effect estimates, um, and we've seen many different uh, figures today that show the concentration response function and the shape of that function. And if I had more time, I would go into the evidence that is included in the 2019 PMISA that shows that there is recent evidence showing uh, superlinear concentration response functions at the lower concentrations, especially for cardiovascular effects and cardiovascular mortality. Uh, we see that with the studies from uh, Canada as well as other US studies, uh, certainly see that here in ELAPS. Um, I also want to fo focus and, and kind of highlight the importance of the co pollutant results that are included in ELAPSE and how they, these um, are weighed quite heavily when we are making causality determinations for ISAs. Um, the you know, potential for uh, confounding by co occurring pollutants is very important. And so these co pollutant results help to reduce that uncertainty related to this potential confounding factor. Uh, the subset analyses that uh, were conducted in ELAPSE are also quite helpful, looking at uh, different threshold concentrations and the results below those thresholds. Um, and then finally, the um, species, the different PM species that were included in ELAPSE, uh, which focused really on black carbon, are also important and something that we talk about quite a bit. And um, I have a slide that shows some results from the 2019 PMISA focusing on these um, PM species. Um, and so first, uh, I'll focus on, on this figure, this heat map here. So as of 2019, there were nine studies that looked at long-term exposure to PM2.5 and mortality that also examined one of these uh, components. And so we focused on studies that um, had both a PM2.5 mass effect estimate as well as an effect estimate for the component. And here for the heat map, the dark blue is a statistically significant positive association. The light blue is a positive, though not statistically significant association. Uh, the red would be a negative statistically significant association. And this kind of orange or peach color would be a negative, but not statistically significant association. Um, and we can see that of the nine studies that looked at PM2.5, they also have positive results. Almost all of them are statistically significant. Um, five of those studies also looked at black carbon and elemental carbon. They also have positive statistically significant associations. So the results from ELAPSE would fit right in here, very consistent with what we've seen in previous studies. Um, I do want to point out that you know, for the integrated science assessment, the question that we're really asking is, would there be a component that would be a better indicator to use in the regulatory process? And so when we look across all of these results, we conclude that PM2.5 remains to be the best indicator for regulatory purposes. Um, and you can see some, um, some quotes from the ISA there. Uh, I also want to just quickly point out that we find it very important to, uh, if, when we're comparing PM2.5 mass to uh, PM components, that we are looking at a comparable indicator or a comparable interval for the effect estimate. So we've scaled everything to the interquartile range. And so this little table up here at the top, this gives you an indication of how we've done that um, with the published 25th and 75th percentile um, concentrations, calculating the IQR. In this case, for black carbon, the results presented in the ELAP study were identical to the IQR and very similar for PM2.5. So it really didn't change uh, the effect estimates very much. And then I just have two more slides. Um, 
talking both about ozone and NO2. So this slide includes um, studies in black that were included in the uh, 2020 ozone ISA, looking at long-term exposure to ozone and um, mortality. And this is um, unfortunately a mix of studies that use the ozone concentration average over the entire year, as well as some that just use the warm season. Um, but you can again see how the ALAP study kind of fits in. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the, the effect estimates that are below one observed in ALAPS. Um, and then what you see once you start controlling for co-pollutants and other things. But th this is not particularly abnormal. We can see that similar things have been um, observed elsewhere, especially in some of the European cohorts. Uh, we can see that for the Medicare cohort in the United States and the MAPLE study in Canada, we see small positive associations between ozone and mortality. So there is some difference there. Um, and I think you know, we can have a, a more in-depth discussion um, if people have questions about why there could be some uh, discrepancies there. And then finally, I have a figure for NO2 or NOx. Um, and again, this is the one of our older assessments, which was finished in 2016. So the studies in black have not been updated since 2016, but I still wanted to place the ELAP studies here in, in context. And you can see that these are some of the lower concentrations uh, compared to some of these somewhat older studies but the results are very consistent with what we've seen in the past. Um, and they provide um, really important evidence of these concentrations that are, are lower and lower. Um, and with that, I will end um, and move on. Great, thank you very much, Tom. And uh, Last but not least, we, I will invite Thomas Heinrich from European Commission uh, to give his reflection on um, the elapsed results and implication for upcoming European legislation. And we heard that there is an upcoming air quality directive uh, revision in EU. Thomas Heinrichs is a deputy head of unit at the European Commission's Clean Air Unit at the Directorate General for Environment. He, his work focuses on both the implementation of and the further development of the European Union's Ambient Air Quality Directive. So the floor is yours, Thomas. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation and um, also giving me the, uh, this final slot that basically should culminate and bring together all the expectations into a policy setting. And I cannot really assure you that I will disappoint you thoroughly on, on, on that end, but I would like to use the slot um, to, to remind you of what we're doing at the moment in this process of revising the Air Quality Directive, which is an opportunity to actually bring um, the legislation in Europe more closely to the scientific recommendations. And um, realizing that not everyone in the call is from Europe, maybe a quick reminder that we in Europe have a three pillar uh, approach to, e to clean air policy that builds on an ambient air quality directive and national emission um, reduction commitment directives and source legislation and based on a fitness check that we've carried out and done thorough extensive analysis of what works and doesn't work in the green deal we announced to, that we will strengthen this legislation by on the one hand proposing um, to tighten up the provisions on monitoring modeling and air quality plans and on the other hand and this is the big one that is discussed today of course to revise the air quality standards to align them more closely with the WHO recommendations. Now, the WHO recommendation is, of course, a science-driven um, set of uh, reflections and assessments. And those in any policy reflection and uh, approach, in Europe at least, we would underpin by subjecting it to a so-called impact assessment. So where we look at these recommendations and see when we translate these into policy options, what would the implications be for environment and health on the one side, for socioeconomic considerations, for technological feasibility, and also not least uh, what the administrative burden would be. And that of course shapes the picture when we translate from the science recommendation to a policy uh, proposal itself. To illustrate this uh, quickly, um, something that is familiar with you, the WHO has come forward with the uh, new guidelines, the guideline level for PM2.5, which I take here as a headline indicator because it is responsible for the majority of mortality that we see in Europe associated to air pollution. 
is at five. And then we see in the guidelines themselves some interim targets that have been put forward as the WHO indicated a certain consciousness that the guideline levels themselves may be a big jump for some reason, regions across the globe and also within Europe. And you see that there are consequences of not meeting the guidelines that are quite significant when it comes to mortality. And for our policy proposal, of course, we need to translate these guidelines and other scientific recommendations into different policy options, which we very loosely label here. And please do not read too much into the words themselves, into high ambition, medium ambition, low ambition, to compare those against the baseline. So the standard that we have today to, again, assess, as I said before, an impact assessment, what the consequences of setting these targets would be for Europeans health, society, economy, but also for technical feasibility. Now, this gap that uh, Anne spoke to about is of course um, one that is a gap between a standard and a guideline, but there's also a gap of course that is different depending on where in Europe between where we are now and where we would want to be depending on where, whether we're talking about a medium, high or low ambition level. This is a complicated slide. You probably have seen it. I'm just going to tell you what it says very briefly. This basically summarizes all the monitoring stations we have in Europe for the year 2019, where for each country, you see the lowest measured level and the highest measured level. So pick your favorite country. And you see where the two, blocks, two, two blue box meet, where you have the average level in a country. And if you superimpose this to the different ambition levels that I just showed to you before, high ambition where the guidelines are in interim target four, interim target three, and the current levels, you see that only very few stations these days still report levels above the air quality standards that we have set ourselves, but also very few level uh, stations and very few countries are below the current guideline levels, and the majority of them are quite a big step away from them. So this also is to illustrate that ambition level depends a lot on where you stand at the moment and the gap that you might need to, to bridge. And in some cases, our preparatory analysis shows that this gap might not be bridgeable at all for some regions in Europe. But of course, we are still doing the analysis at the moment. So I said we're doing an impact assessment. I showed to you what we do for um, PM 2.5. To get a full picture, we are assessing scenarios to see what it would mean to do the uh, to reach these ambition levels in 2030 and 2050, because obviously the consequences of these different time frames are different, both for the health impacts and um, for the economic impacts. And we also need to do a similar assessment for our two other policy areas when we look at the legislative frame that we are dealing with. So what kind of penalties are related to air quality standards, what kind of information provisions do we have? And also in area three, where we look into the changes to monitoring, modeling, and plans. So we assess these options separately and then need to combine those to policy packages. And that is not trivial because it may well be that a uh, policy package that is ambitious in policy area one cannot be combined with a, an ambitious policy option in policy area two, hypothetically. So we would need to assess whether that is actually doable in combination. I mean, to put it very bluntly or very easily, it's very easy to sign up to a target if it doesn't mean anything. So one of the things we can be actually also rather um, um, confident about in the past that we have been able to enforce our um, limit values, and it would be important to have an enforceability also looking ahead. My um, penultimate slide is this one is that I showed you PM 2.5, but when we look to the scientific community, we of course talk about more pollutants than just the PM 2.5. We have the six pollutants that the WHO has looked at, and we would take the guidelines as the starting point for that assessment. But then we also have the six pollutants that the WHO this time has not looked at, but has looked at in the past, where we would need to base ourselves on the WHO levels in 2000 and other sources that have come online since. And there are the two additional pollutants, ultrafine particles and black carbon, for which we now have good practice statement, so that we would also need to consider in our assessment of policy area one. My final slide is a timeline slide that most of you probably have seen, but just to, to add it to the mix of slides here to 
illustrate that we are now about halfway point between finishing our fitness check and hopefully getting a decision from our co-legislators uh, based on a proposal that we are working to put on the table in the second half of 2022. A key step to doing that is the impact assessment that I mentioned. And another key step is an online public consultation that we are doing this very moment. It's open on the 23rd of September. It'll close on the 16th of December. And it's um, open to everyone. And we can only invite you to contribute to that because this is the phase where we are listening to views so that we can deliver a as complete impact assessment as possible to inform our proposal. That was a bit of a tour de force. The whole set of slides, including the preparatory analysis and some of the underpinning of the statements I casually made en passant, you can find in the slides that uh, I put a link on into on the chat that you will probably all have access to. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this nice overview of the legislative process uh, undergoing. And thank you all discussions uh, for your short presentations. It's five o'clock now and we decided to extend the session by 15 minutes to give time uh, to all uh, everybody to pose some questions and to have a discussion with the panelists. And I will open the floor for the first question. And I believe this one is to the rota. Some of have been answered, but we'll bring them up again. Dorota, would you comment on the choice of health endpoints in health impact assessment, given the increase in knowledge base of the effects of air pollution on many metabolic and cognitive diseases? Uh, thank you. Uh, so at the very beginning of the process, um, the group, the guideline development group agreed on the health outcome prioritization framework. So there was quite a process leading to the selection of critical health outcomes considered in the air quality guideline development process. At the same time, there is of course this recognition of the knowledge advancements related to metabolic diseases, uh, impacts, um, effects uh, in relation to neurocognitive, neurodevelopmental health endpoints. However, the body of evidence that um, uh, would allow to uh, conduct systematic review of the evidence and to adhere to all the steps of deriving air quality guidelines was considered sufficient for those health outcomes that were ultimately included in the, in the document. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions uh, that have come up on superlinearity um, from two or three different questioners. The first one was very basic. Can you, and this was going probably to Tom Lubin, I think at this stage, can you explain the concept of superlinearity and, um, and what it means? And also uh, from another questioner, does superlinearity mean that particles in the air at lower concentrations may have impacts at higher levels than, um, than particles at lower levels? Um, so yeah, I'll do my best to take a shot at this one and, and others can please um, weigh in. But when I'm thinking about superlinearity in the concentration, the shape of the concentration response relationship for something like PM2.5 and mortality, uh, the way I like to think about it is, um, you know, the, the cost proportional hazards models that are often used here are modeling an increase in PM, often annual, um, averaged over an annual or, or multi-year time period. And so, for example, in the forest plot, I've presented those effect estimates for a five microgram per meter cubed increase. And so for every five microgram per meter cubed increase, we're seeing some increase in risk if we're seeing a positive concentration response relationship. Um, for something that's super linear, the way I think about it is that the uh, increase from say five microgram per meter cubed to 10 microgram per meter cubed would have a higher risk estimate, a higher hazards ratio than going from 15 microgram per meter cubed to 20 microgram per meter cubed. So um, the slope of the line is steeper at the lower concentrations and it becomes less steep at the higher concentrations. Um, hopefully that helps to contextualize a little bit. Um, Massimo is the statistician here, so he can correct me if I made an incorrect statement. Thank you, that was actually very good. Thank you, Tom. Um, Eva Malmquist has a question for Thomas. Uh, Heinrich, 
Why have EU policies failed to provide cleaner air to special Eastern European countries? Those furthest away on your on your graph. Yeah, that I was just about to type the response in the Q and A, so I can actually just take it live. I mean, we've carried out a, a rather extensive fitness check, and in the fitness check, we looked um, across all pollutants and, of course, all countries, and we did see that we had improvements in air quality pretty much throughout Europe. So there's been an improvement and a reduction in the number of exceedances, the extent of exceedances, and the magnitude of exceedances. So I would not say we have failed to deliver clean air. I think where we're not at is that we have clean air. So that is maybe, I know that is a, maybe a little bit of a, a semantic game I'm playing here, but it's important not to put the baby out with the bathwater. I do think that we have seen significant improvements. Now, where we do not have these um, improvements, and you point particularly to Eastern Europe, that has to do, of course, with the specific setting that these regions face and the kind of sources that lead to that air pollution in those, in those areas. In those countries that you refer to in particular, we see uh, a predominant impact of uh, energy emission sources, so sources from the energy sector, in particular in residential heating. Of course, also still transport emissions, but it is very often linked to the way that energy is sourced in those regions. And that is, of course, part of the bigger discussion about the energy systems that fuel our society. But it's linked, often linked to that. But then again, each exceedance has its own story. And that's also something to, to keep in mind, which is why the, the air quality directive in the past has stayed away from offering and prescribing a one size fit all approach but to require local authorities, the competent authorities responsible for air quality to develop their own plans that fit to the purpose of that region. So a pretty, pretty long answer. And the short answer could have been residential heating. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Thanks. This is a question uh, that came up earlier uh, and probably best directed toward you, Dorota. Um, what sources need to be targeted to decrease PM 2.5 and PM 10 to meet the new WHO air quality guidelines? You touched on this a little bit in your talk, but um, perhaps that could be expanded. Thanks a lot. I mean, the, the guidelines uh, as such are not really targeting sources. A kind of a proxy to this is, is good practice statements for Beck Carmen and then so I guess this is also a question that can be shared also with, 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 with Thomas, but uh, for sure the, the sources related to combustion, especially of, 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 of uh, fossil fuels, so different combustion processes, uh, including residential housing, uh, including in transport and other processes uh, that would uh, affect uh, beneficially uh, PM. Thank you, Dorota. Question for you, Thomas, again, from Giovanni Vieci, former president of European Respiratory Society. He says, in 2012 to 13, ERS campaigned to lower the legally binding EU values, 10 principles of clean air published in ERS journal. I participated in positive initiatives at the EU Parliament. However, our advocacy campaign was unsuccessful since there were different positions from industry which warned the EU institution about the social sustainability, increase in employment of lowered air pollution levels. Do you think that this time the campaign for clean air may encounter less objections and may be more successful? Well, that is a it's a it's a good question. I, I would say that whatever happened in 2013 was not unsuccessful either, because we did have a clean air program for Europe that uh, was put forward in 2013, that ultimately resulted in the update of the National Emission um, Reduction Commitments Directive. So we we with that set um, Europe on a path to reducing the health impacts from air pollution by 50 percent or 48 percent back then. By now we're moving it up bit by bit with the Zero Pollution Action Plan. So I, I don't think it, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying it was not successful, but I do recognize what you say is that there's a, of course, a, um, a plethora of views about the feasibility and the consequences of tightened air quality standards. So on the one hand, the health benefits that we're discussing now are pretty obvious, and they also can be quantified, and they have been quantified in 2013 and are being quantified now. 
But at the same time, of course, that meets a reality where there are other um, sectoral interests that not necessarily out of nefarious reasons, but for reasons of uh, trying to put Europe on a trajectory towards this, have a different estimation of how that can be done, that we will face also this time. So I do not think there is, um, there is a, fundamentally, um, a fundamentally different discussion that we do not have to constantly and clearly articulate what the health benefits are, because there are other questions in play. So we need to make sure that the health benefits are formulated well as well. Um, depending on where you stand, health benefits can override all of these other issues. Other stakeholders in society with similar voices may have different views, and that's where this public consultation that we have becomes also quite important. So um, do I think this time we'll be seeing less objections? I don't know. I don't, it's difficult to speculate. I think we'll see similar objections, but the question is how society as a whole will look at Thank you very much, if, Thomas. Could I just add to that, Sarana, uh, because I wanted to say, um, one thing that I think has definitely changed uh, from, from a couple of years ago is, is the level of awareness and also the level of concern within the population. You know, we have seen more and more people that want clean air and that have come out with a clear call, including in Eastern Europe, where you have lots and lots of grassroots um, organizations in Poland, for example, with anti-smog uh, organizations or, you know, in uh, citizens movements in Bulgaria. And, you know, you have so many people across the EU actually uh, monitoring uh, clean air to find out, well, what is the situation, you know, in front of my, my doorstep, you have um, thousands of people who responded to petition. So I think it's very clear that uh, you know the the readiness uh, and the you know the, the call uh, in our population is there. Uh, unfortunately, where where the you know the resistance has been and and the blockage has been, and I want to be very clear about that, is with the national governments. And I think they very much uh, lag behind. They lag behind what the people want in their country, and they lag behind what the science says. And this is why uh, this time. It's really, really important that uh, our national leaders, they, they, you know, they hear the scientific evidence and they hear the call to better protect our health. And I think especially after the pandemic, when you know we have seen uh, all these many efforts to protect our health and we, health concerns have really risen you know, to the top of the political agenda, uh, I think this also has to translate now into what we're talking about, the standards. Uh, I don't mean advocating for the same kind of measures, uh, but I think in terms of the level of commitment, this is definitely something we want to see now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Time for one final question, Bob? Uh, sure. Um, I will say uh, it's there are a number of questions in the chat in, in the Q&A that we won't get to today, and a number of them focus on these issues, particularly around uh, Southeastern Europe. One of them, and it's a challenging question for sure, as I start noticing a certain reluctance toward new WHO air quality guideline, arguing the feasibility issue, the population acceptability, the uncertainty surrounding measurements, or modeling of low air pollution levels, and that we are reaching natural or biogenic air pollution emissions. I wonder if there are any remarks on this. Um, and I know the commission is just starting your process, so it's a bit of a challenging question, but these are out there as real questions. And if I may, Bob, um, we had this the question from Silvia Medina, I think I saw in the okay. chat. We had similar concerns and reservations um, 15 years ago when the last uh, air quality guidelines were promulgated and when the last uh, air quality directive was uh, put together, as, as, as Thomas uh, mentioned. And over time, uh, I think uh, many jurisdictions came to the realization that doing something about air pollution was more feasible than they thought initially. And they've actually done so. And uh, in fact, in, in the lab study, with our back extrapolation to baseline levels, we actually demonstrate clearly and directly that these levels of pollution have come down more than we anticipated were possible in 2005. And that they actually have an have an impact on the uh, the and the way we do our studies and do our analyses. Uh, something which we haven't talked about much this afternoon, but which may be important to uh, to mention also, is the co-benefits issue. And many solutions to pollution problems, as we see them today, uh, all center on that we need to reduce combustion of anything, 
fossil fuels, but eventually also biomass fuels. This is something that's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in 10 or 20 years. But the solution to many of the climate problems that we are facing is also to strongly reduce combustion of fossil fuels, especially, and depending on how you view it, it uh, pro probably also uh, biomass combustion. So I think if we can have a focused discussion on the co-benefits issues of the climate policies on the one hand and the pollution problems policies on the other hand, focusing on reduction of combustion across the board over a long period of time that it's going to take, we may uh, have a perspective which is uh, better than what Sylvia is, uh, is fearing, I think. And maybe Thomas can say a few words about the co-benefits issue as well. Can I just wanted to make sure Dorota didn't want to come in first. <laughs> just, just very briefly, I think, of course, the, 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 the area is very complex, but really stressing the relevance of health benefits, let's say per se, and health co-benefits is critically important because this is such an important component into these discussions and equations related then to economic investments, societal, um, acceptance, uh, etc. So if we if we can quantify and convey the message of the health gains of the health benefits of uh, of actions, this uh, is something that that really needs to be strengthened. And uh, yes, in, in, indeed, exploring also these co benefits of of mitigating climate change and uh, uh, reducing um, the the sources of uh, of, of, of air pollution needs to be even more prominently highlighted. I mean, the guidelines were issued just a few weeks uh, to, to before the, the upcoming COP in Glasgow. And, uh, and we would also very much like to, to uh, bring these uh, agendas to, to the attention of uh, people um, involved also in the, in the health program of, of, of COP and of course beyond. Thank you. Okay, thank Could you I, very much. Go ahead, Thomas. I thought I just wanted. I thought I. I mean, I. I think I owe Sylvia still an answer, so I wanted to yes, not please. just uh, dodge away from this, which is. Um, I don't think it's a certain reluctance to the uh, to the WHO guidelines. I think that the commitment to align more closely is pretty firmly. Um, I mean, it's part of the European Green Deal, and none of the scenarios that we are analyzing doesn't doesn't make a step a significant step from where we are today to a something closer to the WHO guideline levels. Having said that, I think it is, um, it is important to subject this to a proper impact assessment to see what we are, would be signing up to as a society by putting ourselves into a, a world where there's a target one or target two. And that can only be done if we assess the feasibility properly. So there are some concerns and uh, they are based on sound modeling, sound exercise, and they're also to answer Bert's uh, own question, they took take into account the co-benefits and the decarbonization perspective that we have, that even with that, there may be regions where it's not possible to go all the way to, but I mean, as we know from the curves that you showed so impressively, that every step along the way will bring health benefits. So again, I, I'm not as, uh, I wouldn't, I don't quite share the pessimism that is in the question, because every step towards that five in itself brings health benefit. Now, the question is for us to assess properly what is the policy consequence of choosing a specific target so that then the co-legislators actually can take an informed decision on what they are willing to commit to. Because in the end, and I'm pointing to that, it all hinges on member states and competent authorities being able to implement this. And if we, as a, if we set ourselves a target that we cannot reach, then the efforts to implement this fully may also be less satisfactory. So in that sense, um, I think it's, it's about finding the best possible balance in an impact assessment that takes into account the more close alignment and to mean that as more closely to the WHO. So I, I hope that gives you a bit of confidence that we're not dismissing this option and we're analyzing this but we're not going to be able to subscribe to any outcome before we haven't done the analysis. Thank you very much, Thomas, for, for, for leaving this at, at, at an optimistic, positive note for, from European Commission. 
Uh, I thank everybody for great questions, great discussion. I think now we're almost 20 minutes over time and we could go probably for 20 minutes more easily, but we have to wrap up this session now. Uh, I hope that this session with a showcase of elapsed results shows us along with WHO air quality guidelines and massive other evidence that came recently in just last few years on enormous health effects, even at air, air levels way below current legislation, just provide more solid evidence and support to this health argument in, in all legislative decision making. So, so we're also optimistically with you, Thomas, looking forward um, air quality directive uh, revisions and, and we'll patiently listen. Uh, along with this, we would also like to announce that uh, in, in this nice collaboration, HEI with ERS, we are planning a next webinar, uh, probably early next year, where we will once again take uh, the newest evidence on the uh, health effects of uh, air pollution at low exposure once again, uh, to summarize the newest as we see things are developing at, at very large speed. And we will announce that webinar in, in due time, so, so keep in tuned. I would like to thank, uh, thank HI for great collaboration organized the webinar, all the speakers presenting the exciting results from Elabs, and all the discussants for, for your excellent talks and contributions, and, and you, Thomas, for patiently explaining the legislative process. So with this, uh, and thanks all participants, we're very overwhelmed with great support. We were 420 participants at, at, at the best at, at some point of time, and over 700 registered. So thank you very much. And by this, I will close the session and you will be all able to get the link to the recorded session as well as slides. So thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>